Okay, good evening. Thank you very much, Steve, for inviting me. Uh, of course, we, uh, it ha happened that with Steve, we presented at the same workshop in London. He was the keynote speaker. I was just one of the others uh, talking uh, on education. And uh, uh, Steve mentioned that there might be an interesting audience here in Plymouth, which I visit frequently, examining PhD students usually here. So I accepted and I'm very grateful and thank you for coming. So I introduced myself uh, somehow uh, with an interesting journey. So uh, originally born and school in, in Jordan. Uh, then I moved to Hungary, Budapest, maybe surprising for some people. Nine years in Hungary, got all my university education, went back to Jordan. Uh, working for family reason mainly a couple of years. Then Germany, uh, I received a prestigious uh, Alexander von Humboldt Fellowship and award. And uh, then uh, also invited to become a guest professor at the University of Dresden. And uh, then moved to England, to the University of Bradford, spent three years there. Uh, as a senior lecturer, director of research in the, uni in the University of Bradford, and ended up in, in Wales. So, interesting journey, and uh, as such, of course, uh, I did things. Currently, I am a professor of mobile computing and networking, so I apologize to the those who are working as teachers or in education, trying to teach you things that probably you know more than I do. I am just trying to give uh, one point of view from uh, our experience in building mobile apps and the way we interacted with a number of teachers, a number of organizations who want to create uh, educational tools and the way we think this can help. So I'm not going to teach you anything about teaching but it's just a point of view. I'm director of CMAS, and I'm going to speak about CMAS in a couple of slides, uh, the Center of Excellence in Mobile Application and Services, which is, although it's a big activity on its own, but it's also part of a, a research center we call Integrated Communications Research Center. And this is why, where my research lies. So uh, this is not going to be a research presentation as such, uh, because we do a lot of work on uh, uh, communication systems from what we call physical layer. So I have a uh, subgroup in this research center do dealing with antennas, developing antennas. Whereas other group, they're building uh, systems for the next generation wireless uh, LAN uh, that can work on 40 and 60 gigahertz for indoor environment. Uh, I have another group working on uh, home automation and smart metering for energy and other stuff. So we have a, a number of subgroups within the center. This mobile application and, and services form part of the center. The, it was the lucky part that got the money, so it is the biggest part, but it's not the main one. Outside the university, I also do a couple of uh, roles. Um, I'm very active in the modeling and simulation area. So I am uh, currently the president of the European Council for Modeling and Simulation. And I just finished last year uh, being the president of uh, the Federation of European Simulation Societies. This is an organization that uh, covers all of Europe. We have 32 uh, national societies as member of the Federation, organizing major conferences and major events. And uh, as part of what we do, our research, we spin out a, a company. Uh, it's called Lifeguard Security, but it's not different security from the security you, uh, Steve and the team here. Do. It's an actual premise security CCTV and uh, combined with home automation and uh, control. So, interesting life. So, coming to the the motivation, the, the, the background of uh, this work 
It's coming from a project that I started in, in Wales. Coming from our research, we established in Wales, in the, my university, a lab which is a real life, next generation core network. A network that allows uh, communication between internet and traditional telecom. And a uh, very interesting link to Plymouth again. That at that time, the whole idea started between myself and Paul, Professor Paul Reynolds, who was a member of this uh, uh, group. At that time, he was with Orange Labs UK. So jointly, we came up with the idea, and we developed it to become basically a test bed for next generation services. So I wanted to make it bigger than it was. Uh, yes, we were supported by Orange Labs. Actually, with Plymouth, at, the time, at that time, my university was called Glamorgan. With three more universities, we were the only university in the UK that Orange Labs supported and dealt with. So I received a lot of support from Orange Labs to build it. But what I wanted is to put it in the service of companies in Wales, businesses in Wales. So I went to the Welsh government, told them that this is, this is a facility, fantastic, very good, but uh, it cannot be used by students only. It's too, much, too good to be limited to the university. Three years of my life negotiating with the Welsh government managed to get uh, at the center of excellence. Uh, and the idea is to support businesses. And if you know the geography, this is the, uh, basically uh, Wales. And you see a lot of companies that we supported all around Wales. We build apps there. Of course, you see that the key thing that we build apps. The center itself is uh, quite substantial in, in size. It's 6.4 million uh, pound project, uh, funded partially by Europe and partially by the University of South Wales. And it, the whole thing came up uh, on the back of this innovative way of supporting companies. What I uh, proposed to the Welsh government is to change the way they support businesses in the area because in their mentality, because they are government, they are civil servants, what they can do is to give money. So a company that has fantastic idea, they used to go to the Welsh government, ask filling applications to get 10,000 pounds. The biggest problem with their approach is that they ask in this application form at the beginning, how much money do you need? And if you are building something innovative, something new project, some new idea, I don't know. So they put a number, and I, this number either too big and the application get rejected, or too small and the product never uh, get finished. So I tell them, rather than doing that, give us the money, we will build the center, I create expertise, a whole team from uh, market researchers to uh, res uh, actual uh, researchers to developer quality control testing, and we give the company a finished product. Wasn't easy, but we, I was successful in that, and we managed to get the money. So, in 2011 we started, and it is uh, running until 2015. So the, the argument behind this was this: so to create a, a world-class research and development center uh, in mobile application and uh, solutions, uh, we were one of the impact studies for the REF 2014 and 40% of our uh, research was uh, either four star or three star in impact. So, and it was based on our case study. So impact wise, we managed to get it right, I think. Uh, assist Welsh businesses, of course, that's what I was talking about, give them innovation. And of course, we created a, what we call mobile innovation network in South, in South Wales, and over all Wales basically, but mainly in South Wales, for businesses to meet and have uh, activities like this and learn. We got uh, keynote speakers from um, all around the world. And uh, helping Welsh government to get more uh, companies to come to Wales. And actually we were successful in that, at least five, six major companies when they came to South Wales, they collocated with us because they wanted to use the, ex the expertise that we have. And they were storing my, stealing my, my stuff as well. But that's part of it. And that's part of the last uh, the objective actually, because what we wanted is 
to train people and pass them to industry. So usually we get new stuff, we train them. Once they are good trained, companies pay them double salary and they just go. But we are a university and that's no problem. So this is what we do. We do mobile apps and we have built a large number of mobile apps already. Of course, mobile apps, I don't want, need to convince anyone about the importance of mobile apps because just uh, if you look at your mobile, you will see uh, average number of mobile apps on <laughs> the pocket of any one of us will be around 100. Some of them you use because you download it yourself. Lots of them are just there, come with the phone. So we use them, this became part of our life. But there are for many others, they are business. So for us, it's an important, it's utility. We use them for fun, for other reasons. But they, all, they are also important because they can make business. And uh, I just got these statistics. Of course, they have some part which is based on actual numbers. The rest is prediction. And as we know always, prediction never works. We try to predict the future. But uh, the numbers are staggering here. If you look at the number of downloads, there are uh, 200 billion downloads expected to be in 2017. Uh, in dollars, they are, they are again reaching $800 billion. That's a huge amount of business to, to leave just going, not to participate in. And actually, yeah, 60, 60 billion uh, in, in revenue, but in total downloads, 800 billion downloads. Huge amount of downloads. Of course, we are here not about this, what we'll talk about, what we are trying to do. So over the last five, uh, four years, we worked uh, in CMAS to help companies, 140 companies assisted, and what by, we mean by assistance here, sitting with them, analyzing their needs, and see whether an app is suitable for them to get their revenue better, to get their marketing better, to get their operation processes better. Uh, 60 uh, projects started, uh, we have 40 products, and this is uh, the key success criteria. We promised the government 30, we managed to get 40 finished products. So we have 40 companies in Wales that uh, came up with the idea, and we managed to get this idea to a product they use, either they sell or they use internally to improve. Six new businesses and 15 new jobs. This Apps uh, and some, when, I, when we say apps, actually we are more than just apps. Uh, many of the systems that we build go, the app is just one part of it. I give you a few examples. One of the uh, projects that we did is about uh, uh, creating a system for uh, people who want to uh, ride horses. And we created a system with sensors all around the saddle, and this is con this sensor is connected to uh, an app with with the uh, headphone, and the app can tell the person to sit right, uh, left to get the right posture and on the on the saddle on the horse. The same technology we used to help uh, disabled people sitting on a chair because the way they sit can affect their health, and this system can make allow them to to right, have the right. Uh, posture on the, on the wheelchair. So um, when I say apps, we never go for these small apps that anyone can build in the back, uh, back of their room. Uh, it, they are usually apps that uh, involve num research as well as other kind of development. And we did in all kinds of sectors. Very interesting. Um, in agriculture, uh, we did an app to measure whether the grass is ready to be cut or, or, or to be allowed the cattle to come to, to be fed on the grass because you don't want to damage this kind of cycle. A lot of other uh, things, but you see here education is one of the sectors that we help. So we we'll move now to speak about this in particular. And you say that we had started this discussion in, in the foyer there. And people say, why should we use apps for education? 
And it's because of, of simple, simple reasons. A uh, study I found very interesting about teenagers. And they said 66% of them sleep with mobile phones in their bed. So 84% prefer internet over TV or a car. In my generation, well, TV was <laughs> all what we wanted. Now, it's not the case. And 76% prefer to lose everything in the house before broadband. So that's a change of, of everything. And, and I agree with, with the, uh, my colleague here, a teacher, who said that, yeah, we as management of schools or things, we don't want to change because we are used to a certain way of, of working. But the, the, the kids, they are changing. They are different than the time when we were there. And very interesting, of course, I'm sure you heard about this kind of uh, um, terminology about digital natives and um, digital immigrants. What I found this in Mark Prinsky's book, who defines this in a very interesting way. Because what he defined as a digital immigrant, and I consider myself one of those, although I work all the time in, in mobile apps, we like to receive control release of information from limited sources. We look at uh, Daily Telegraph. We do look at certain kind of sources of information. When I want to hear news, I always go to uh, Sky Channel and, and or Sky or BBC to, lo to look at it. So it's sing we would do singular focus task. Prefer to get information from text. We, we still read uh, newspapers. Yeah. Uh, when you get this kind of generation to work together, they always sit and create an agenda. So before we, any meeting, we have to have a preset agenda with a certain who can speak first, who can then. So, and of course, we like linear and logical order for information. If we look at digital natives and Intentionally, I didn't put this kind of kids. Usually, they, I, I used to have a small kids. They are even more than this. But even at university or uh, A-level, you see that receive information quickly from multiple sources. So you, in minutes, go to Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, as well as look at the uh, new, newspaper. Multitasking and parallel processing, yeah? Graphical elements before text, we knew that at our age, that uh, an image tells more than a thousand words, but we never applied that. It is now hyperlink sources interacting in real time and key thing, user generated content. So if you look at this, it's completely different world. The, the, the way the young generation learn, I have children myself, I have a, an 18, years old as well as eight year, years old children. And I can see even between this young generation, the younger is far more advanced in his technology understanding. And they want to have fun. And I found, that I found this is the most relevant thing. They want to learn while having fun. Because that's the difference. That's the, that will make the difference in the learning. If it be, even in today's schools, we still teach them in a very traditional, very old-fashioned way. This is a black and white picture here. But if you just color it, maybe uh, dress is not as modern, but it's still the same way our classrooms look like. In my university, most of, if you go to examination, you will see the same thing. Now. Even here, maybe the lecture theater is looking different, but most of the time you will see students sitting in the same way. But when these kids grow, they go, go to this kind of uh, school or they come to university, what they expect is this. Because this is, this is what they want to see. They want, they've had iPad at home, they come to school, not allowed to use iPad. They had everything, they like uh, the Xbox, everything, and they come to the university of the school, that's not allowed. So just 
going to school or go, coming to university, it's look like going back in history. And they hate it. So my son is, if he wants to stay home, the only reason, because he wants to play on Xbox, not because he loves us or, or he wants to see us, he wants to be at home to have all these gadgets, all the Xbox, everything that he has. Of course, a lot of resistance in schools and in universities because, uh, to technology, because the, there's a misunderstanding here. Because it's, uh, they speak about mobile apps, mobile games, as replacing traditional teaching methods. And of course, teachers do not want to just uh, ditch everything they have built over years. Uh, they don't want to move for many reasons, maybe because of their lack of confidence in what they can cope with this. I can't compete with my son. He is in love with this Lego Star Wars <laughs> something on, on Xbox and iPad, I think. And when I go to the room, he keeps asking me, Dad, do you know this? I don't know. <laughs> I'm sorry. I know the Star Wars films and things, but they moved away from that to a different dimension. So I feel embarrassed. I don't want to de destroy this professor image that he has about me. Because uh, some time ago, uh, I was told by a, a mother of uh, his friends saying that my dad is a professor. He knows everything. And he knows to, where to go everywhere. So, so I don't want this to be. And I think the same thing with teachers. If they bring all this into the classroom, kids will know more, and that will be a problem for them. So, but this is wrong. I think from technology perspective, the aim is not to replace this. Because these uh, education methods, teaching methods, have their values, and they need to be maintained. Our understanding in embedding technology in the school is to, to complement these methods and to make them more exciting and more fun. If you can achieve that, then this technology can come to the school and doesn't become a burden on the school, but can be a, an interesting addition. So there was another, uh, and one, one, one way of doing this is, is this, is uh, gamification. It's not gaming, it's gamification. And uh, this gentleman, Gabe uh, Zickerman, defined it very nicely. He said that gamification is the process of using game thinking and game dynamics to engage audience and solve problems. So rather than making it a, an actual game with, with some games that have no educational value on them, we can use these games or the game thinking to make the education itself more interesting. So another study looked at, OK, why? Why do you think using games or apps would increase uh, what would do in the classroom? And this study looks at uh, this from three perspectives, the management of a school, the teachers, and the parents. And very interesting to see that there is a very similar opinion about uh, the reason. And the reasons mainly extends learning beyond the school day. When my child uh, started school and we started this spelling, and he struggled with spelling, I bought a, uh, an app on the iPad called uh, Dinosauros or something like this. And ten, 10 words that he gets from school to learn and go back, and he gets them on, on uh, Tuesday and Monday. He had to set the spelling test. 15 words. The first three times, I think he got between 7 and 10 words out of 15. I bought this app, and it is fun. It, it makes uh, while uh, testing him and learning him, sometimes changing letters, and he has to find which letters is changed. And he started using it. And in a row, he got six times 15 out of 15. So that was really shocking for me. I th then I recognized that, yes, this is the way. So he used this outside the, the time of the lesson. So it's true. It extends the learning beyond the school day. Provides way of students to review material anytime. Obviously, they can log into 
their uh, accounts on uh, model and see what what is the uh, lesson and can check it of course uh, improves school home communication obviously principals do not uh, admit that there is a problem with communication between school and parents so the but it's ac actually it does and increases student engagement for me this is very important this is one of the mo most important things increasing the uh, engagement because they feel that yes the school is is the same we do the similar stuff and personalizes learning as well so if you look at the apps and games they are there this statistic about the number of uh, most popular apple apps uh, on the app store in last year probably now numbers have increased but i think the percentage will continue to be the same and on uh, apple interestingly the education is quite high second to gaming of course games will be always number one but education is quite high it's not as high on android see on android it's quite lower and and there is a reason for that interestingly we did why and because most of the apps for education are paid apps and people believe that uh, on uh, apple people tend to buy more than on android so a lot of people who want to start doing uh, uh, apps for education they do it for um, mainly I, uh, ipads and the other reason for that is that apple had this policy of supporting a lot of schools in the us by giving them ipads for the for the schools uh, similar projects have been here in swansea all schools all children they get ipad when they get to school so this is using ipad is more uh, frequent than in, uh, in in android but overall still this is the overall statistics of all categories and we can see that games of course number one has always but education has quite large percentage here as well so there are lots of them oh sorry oh, yes okay so where do we come to this so what we thought is that we encouraged a lot of companies we had a number of events on education we tried to influence this at least in our small area of Wales. so uh, i myself was a member of a steering uh, advisory committee to the minister who asked us to look at the curriculum uh, ict curriculum for school because ict itself was a boring subject i think uh, some of you uh, agree with me uh, children go have at home computers they use them they fund everything they go to school and then they have to learn something they are not interested in uh, a lot of kids who are bright they want to learn programming and they are not allowed at school so we were looking at creating this kind of, uh, of curriculum where computing digital literacy we call it can start from nursery time to build all the way until you get to, to A levels. Uh, in England, they started uh, like this. Uh, now, computing is taught in uh, schools, and Wales is following suit. Uh, I think next year, again, this will be introduced. But one, one of the key things that we did is starting to uh, introduce this kind of concept to schools in Wales, and we organized a number of events. Uh, for enhancing education through mobile apps and this is mainly to encourage teachers who have ideas because the ideas need to come from teachers they know what is needed and we got quite a significant response a lot of teachers came to us and we helped them to form companies and to build apps and three of them are flying with the very interesting apps uh, that they're using now so we are doing something ourselves on this line so one of the apps that for example we built and here i'm going to give a few examples on on apps that complement complement teaching so th these apps and the way we think sh this should happen is 
the teacher can give the lessons normally. The teacher can deliver the, the, the material as per the curriculum. However, rather than giving this kind of homework to go to do research on uh, healthy, healthy eating, which can become boring because, okay, they go to websites and things. You create an app and you give them the app to go to play with for a couple of days. So the, imagine coming to a class, uh, year six in school, and tell them, your homework for next week is to download the app from the app store and play with it for a, for a couple of days in the, in the evening. And the one who scores the highest will get this and that and maybe a, a lollipop or anything. Wow, they, they will love it. What a nice homework. So they go download the app, play with it. They have to score high to impress, to beat their peers. But the app is not just any app. app. It's, a, it's a game. And this one, for example, is called Golden Caters. It teaches to children about everything, about food, healthy eating, about uh, uh, even the process of uh, uh, planting the seeds. So if you s look at this here, this, uh, this app I didn't bring with me, there are fields and they, we split them into four parts. The four parts represent the four seasons, so we have uh, spring, summer, autumn, and winter, and they can uh, get seeds to implant. When they implant the seeds, of course, if they put something which in the wrong season, it doesn't come, so they can't put strawberries in, uh, in, in winter. It has to be in the right season for it, so they, they learn this, and they can score points by uh, watering the, the plants uh, correctly, and when they water the plants, they will grow, they become fruit and uh, vegetable, they harvest those, and they, then they go to the kitchen. They become part of the cupboards in the kitchen, and the, when they collect enough points, the whole game moves to the kitchen. And then in the kitchen, they have to prepare a recipe of uh, healthy food, and of course, they, if the, there's no uh, components from them, and then they compare it with the correct recipe and uh, they will be scored how close the, the food was to the perfect health of food. A lot of options, a lot of recipes, a lot of things. So this was an idea by a teacher. She won the most innovative uh, um, uh, technology in school in Wales last year and even in, I think uh, on UK level. Fascinating. The kids loved it and they started to learn Rather than doing one just simple thing in the classroom, an example, and they don't like it because usually it's not successful, it's a complete journey they go through this. Another interesting one, history. Uh, anyone of you knows a town called Merthyr Tidfil? Have you heard about Merthyr? Yeah, in Wales, what is it famous for? It's in the news all the time because a couple of years ago, it was number one in the, in the UK in number of people asking for uh, benefits. The most deprived area in the UK, the highest number of um, uh, jobless people. So all the bad news, everything really you, you don't want to hear. But we will tend to forget that Merthyr was the capital of the world when it comes to mining and coal mining. Some time ago, all, all the world depended on, on the trading with Merthyr because the, the mining was in South Wales, most of the mining, as well as steel. The first significant steel factory in the UK started in Merthyr. So, fantastic history. But imagine anyone being asked to go to research the history of Merthyr. No one wants to do that. So a teacher from Merthyr, he was born in Merthyr, and uh, uh, came to us and said that, I want to make the history of Merthyr fun. I want it to become something that kids learn and remember. So we created this app for them. He, we did 
quite significant amount of research to get the right character from the right era, around 1800. Uh, we looked at a lot of kind of uh, from art portraits to find the environment, research architecture, uh, everything. And we managed to get an app where uh, the whole thing was recreated. And the app is about a, a kid who walks into these fields, gets into houses, interacts with people, then uh, with the ladies, and the lady will ask him, you can't get the medicine for your dad who's sick until you play a number of games, and games are from the time of games. During playing and collecting and making a lot of mini games inside the game, they learn. And after that, the teacher, what he did, okay, have you seen this? Have you seen this style of this house? Can you try to find about this? What style of the home? What style of the dress? What style of that? This and that and that. This, is, this iron uh, game, it's at Iron Town, uh, was bought by a number of uh, schools in Canada. They are using it as, as a kind of uh, part of their education. So it's not replacing the curriculum. It's just when they want to study about this period of time in the history, they ask the kids to go to play with it for a, a couple of days. And when they come back, the discussion about something they enjoyed. And they can jump in, ask, answer the question, yes, I remember, I saw this, I saw that. It becomes fun. Uh, another one, interesting, learning Spanish can be challenging for some people, some people not. So this is a, a or any other language, but this is a, a murder in the El Prado. A murder in uh, and El Prado. So, probably you know in uh, Madrid that uh, El Prado is an interesting museum, and uh, the game is about moving around, discovering that as a detective to find clues for a murder that happens there. And while moving, you meet certain objects, you press them, they will say their name, they'll tell you instructions uh, go here, go there, do this, do that. Simple words. And while you are <laughs> playing the detective in this museum, you are learning the language. And the end of it, it will test you simply, and you'll see how, how to learn. A very interesting way of learning a language, so through a game, rather than just trying to memorize uh, vocabulary from, from uh, a book. Even Welsh. <laughs> Challenge. Anyone knows anything from, about Welsh? I don't either. I've been here for there for 11 years. I couldn't manage to learn anything. But my son, he learns Welsh at school. And for kids, even for Welsh kids, it's, it's just a very difficult language. If the parents do not speak Welsh, it's very difficult. So we created this kind of, for uh, three, four, five years old children, a, a kind of a game where they just uh, play uh, with this uh, which character, uh, Redland, and they draw, and they color, and while doing this, they learn the numbers, they learn the colors, and they learn story. And in the top of here, there's always a uh, text that is giving them help, so if they can't manage it, they can switch to English, so they see the English, and then they switch back to Welsh, and learn from it. Again, this will not replace the classroom, but it will support it and will make it fun. The key message here is that, from <laughs> coming from Bruce Perry, is that different kinds of experiences lead to different brain structures. So if these kids go to the school and we treat them differently, give them this kind of experience, we will get innovators, we get uh, people who love school, love learning. If they go to school and have bad experience at school, it's always this kind of boring. They can't wait until they finish it. Probably you will have a dropout and you will have low grades. So coming to your uh, concept about management of schools, thinking if it does not Im improve immediately on the exam results, it's not good. That's wrong because long term, yes, you will not get it immediately, get them to play with a game 
and in, a, in, uh, in the end of their term they will get three grades higher. It will not happen. However, if we look at education as a long-term process, it will uh, make effect because we are getting them different people. So that's it from me now. Uh, it's it's uh, really, as it's not my research area, so I usually I speak about research. I never stop and people have to, to drag me down from the, uh, from the podium. But it is about what we did actually to enhance this. And these are experiences that we gained ourselves from uh, doing these uh, apps and games. Many of them are really very successful. The iron has been uh, flying. Uh, the only problem that he, he, this gentleman needs more funding to make the second and third version of it to make it grow. But the version that we had uh, created for him is, is doing well. It's now adopted in a number of schools as a sub, uh, supplement to the history lesson. So thank you very much.